Record 51, side 1, lesson number 51, the 51st lesson, practical section, life and the family in Britain. We've had a number of conversations together during these last 12 months, but we've never discussed how an average British family lives. That's because we have been living with one all this time and have asked as we went along. I'm sure I've asked a million questions on the subject since I came here, all about the small, the simple things. It's not always easy to understand why we do certain things differently from other people. And the others, in turn, have a reason for their system, just as we have for ours. Of course, there is no way of life which is above criticism, either by those who follow it or by those who prefer to live differently. Preference, I think, has very little to do with it. Human beings are the most adaptable creatures in the world, even when out of their particular element. It's not true, for example, that it is always raining in Great Britain but the rainfall is heavier than in some European countries, Italy and Spain, or Greece. Foreigners are amused by the English habit of carrying an umbrella. We are optimists, but we are nevertheless prepared for the worst, should it come along. Temperaments are different, and this is, I believe, greatly due to the climate in which one grows up though it must be said that race has something to do with a person's general outlook and behaviour. I agree, and that's a good part of the reason why English people make so much of home. Someone once said that an Englishman's home is his castle, and for many people this is true. Gardens seem to be much more common here than where I come from and they are also well looked after. We spend much more of our time away from home, that is, at the cinema, dancing, sitting out in cafes, especially on fine summer evenings. There are not so many opportunities to sit outside, drinking beer or coffee in England. It's safer indoors, and, save for the occasional very hot day, quite acceptable to everyone. But your meals are quite different from ours, too. You have a fairly large meal before going out to work in the morning. Almost no one does that in my country. Yes, I remember that strong black coffee of yours, Maria. But the reason for the miserable breakfast is to be found in an abundant and late supper. English people, for the most part, have tea or supper, just as you like to call it, between 5 and 6.30. Theatres, cinemas, and all other forms of entertainment, as well as bus and train services, all fit in with this way of life. They certainly close the cinemas and theatres early in this country. It is almost unknown for a film to finish at half past twelve or one o'clock, even in London. Of course, the English don't necessarily go to bed at ten or eleven o'clock. Many people talk, listen to the radio, or watch television, or, having been to the cinema or theatre, invite their friends home for a cup of tea or coffee. Yes, you must remember to ask for black coffee, otherwise they give you white coffee and milk, and tea, tea, tea. There's always an excuse for a cup of tea. One might say it's the national beverage, but I like it now. At first, tea with milk struck me as a disgusting mixture, but it really is very enjoyable once the taste is acquired. I like the English Saturday afternoon going to a football match or other sporting event. Maybe taking part in sports or simply meeting friends for a game of billiards or a walk in the country. I don't like going shopping, though. How often I've heard you praise our Saturday afternoon. 
But it's very much like the continental Sunday afternoon, isn't it? Don't let's say too much of Sunday afternoon. For unless one has something special to do, it is the most monotonous day of the week. It is a little boring, but it's all a matter of organization. You needn't be bored on a Sunday. It is essentially a day of rest. But one is not obliged to do so, provided other people also have freedom of choice. Yes, many people have what they call a lazy day on Sunday. And knowing you too, and having visited your respective countries, I can understand that it is not your idea of a pleasant day. Returning to the family once again, I must say that no matter how happy the members of a family may be, there is never any question of stopping John or William or Mary from taking up work in a suitable post, naturally, even though it be a long way from home. You mean the tendency to separate fairly easily, without heartbreaks? That is very often the case, but we feel that the child, brought up with a sense of values and a good education, must, at some point of his or her life, stand on his own feet. That's very different from our viewpoint. A young man or woman at home will often refuse a good position because it is out of easy reach of home. It may be a sense of provincialism that we find in certain people, not necessarily in whole nations, for there have been great explorers from all countries, and there still are today, the missionaries, for example. It is just another of those features that make it a little difficult to understand the way others live without having the experience of personal contact so necessary for objective judgment. Side 2, Grammatical Section Pronunciation and Homonyms In English there is one difficulty which appears to cause many students more trouble than any other, pronunciation. In this respect, our record course has not been wanting, but though one recognizes the sound, there is still for some the doubt as to which of two words to write. I refer to homonyms, words which, although written differently and having meanings quite unconnected, have the same, sometimes exactly the same pronunciation. The foreign student of English should not, however, despair there are numerous ways of identifying the correct word. The difference in meaning between there and there is considerable, yet they are sometimes confused. Here is a list of some common homonyms. Study them, for there are some which may be truly confused unless the reader considers the context in which the word appears. Across, across. A long way, along the way. Bear, bear. But, but. Fair, fair. Male, male. Muscle, muscle. Knave, knave. Pale, pale. Pear, pear. Plain, plain. Tail, tail. Team, team. Where, where. Air, air. Base, base. Break, break. Die, die. Lead, lead. Meet, meet. No, no. One, one. Peace, peace. Peel, peel. Rhyme, rhyme. Tear, tear. Tire, tire. Two, two, two. If you make sentences using them, you will realize that there is much less difficulty in identifying them in context than you imagined. 
notice and take note of any you meet with in your reading until you can identify both sound and meaning immediately. Yet, still, again. Some words in English, such as yet, still and again, are often translated by a single word in foreign languages. This creates an apparent difficulty in choosing the most suitable English term. Yet is normally found in interrogative and negative statements. It has more or less the same meaning as already, up to or at this moment, which is employed in positive sentences. Have you finished your work yet? John has not come back yet. They have already finished. Still is sometimes used with the same meaning as yet. They have still a lot to do. We have a lot to do yet. Have they still not come? Are they not here yet? The difference between the first and second example is that still gives more emphatically the idea of a state which existed at some past time and is unchanged. Yet, in the second, indicates only the state at present. In the two questions, that with still indicates more surprise and sometimes more impatience than yet. Again means once more. If at first you don't succeed, try, try, try again. The problem was wrong the first time, so we did it again. After, then, afterwards. After as a preposition cannot be substituted by afterwards, which is an adverb. It will help those whose memory of things grammatical is no longer very fresh if they remember that the preposition always has a complement which can be identified by saying to oneself, after what? After the party, we all went home. Shut the door after you when you leave. They ran after the thief, but couldn't catch him. After seeing the film, the children played cowboys and Indians. After is also a conjunction sometimes. They were to return home after the train had left. After Mr. and Mrs. Brown went away, everyone decided to turn in. Occasionally, after and then are confused. Perhaps the following example will serve to indicate the difference. He washed his hands after he ate his supper. He washed his hands, then he ate his supper. There are two actions in the above examples. In the first sentence, he ate his supper before washing his hands, while in the second, the actions are reversed. The former shows after, used as a conjunction. Afterwards, as we said, is an adverb, and so is after on occasion, meaning later. Many years afterwards, I met him again. In after life, he grew difficult to bear. It was only afterwards that I realized my mistake. Afterwards, the company sat down to a magnificent meal. Also, two. These two words give much more trouble than they need. It is, however, understandable that the student of English may find himself a little perplexed from time to time. They both mean the same, but it is rather the way they are used which causes inaccuracies to creep into one's English. Let us look at a few comparable examples and note the difference. A. He, too, came into the country with us. B. He also came into the country with us. C. He came into the country with us, too. D. We went into the country. He came into the country also. In example A, Two is quite specific and means that he, in addition to the others, went into the country. In example B, also does not refer to the subject, but probably to a statement previously made. He stayed at the seaside for a month. He also came into the country with us. Example C may have the same meaning as either A or B, since the first is considered literary today, and the inflection as well as the context 
will help the listener to understand what the speaker intends.